This video essay is part three of a three-part series that examines the Kierkegaardian existentialism set in motion by Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy. You can also read the original article on which these video essays are based by following the link provided in the description box below. In both the article and the series, I chart the differing existential states of the trilogy's enduring couple, Jesse and Celine, as well as the ensuing complications that arise from their clash. In part one, the relevant aspects of Kierkegaard's philosophical project were established, namely the aesthetic, ethical and religious spheres of existence, the border zones of irony and humour that rest between them, and the concept of aesthetic immediacy. Following this, the initial existential states of Jesse and Celine in Before Sunrise were identified as representing two different strands of the aesthetic way of life, the former being a sensual aesthete and the latter being a reflective aesthete. What unites these two strands is their absorption in immediate experience, and therefore lack of any ethical commitments required for a defined existence. I also argue that the form of the film, namely Linklater's trademark use of long dialogic takes and open endings, facilitated this way of relating to the world. In part two, I turned to Before Sunset and examined the existential evolution the leading couple had undergone since parting ways in Vienna. I made the case that Jesse had matured into a reflective aesthete, an individual absorbed in reflective ascetic experience, and Celine had become an ironist, an individual who is detached from the aesthetic sphere, yet is not able to appropriate the ethical requirement into their life. In this video, I will turn to Before Midnight and examine the existential stagnation that now characterises their lives, as well as the relational disharmony that has surfaced as a result. Linklater's third and so far final instalment picks up another nine years later on the Greek Peloponnese Peninsula, where we learn that Jesse and Celine are now in a long-term relationship, although not officially married, and have since had unplanned twins. The film charts a day at a writer's retreat spent with their children and friends, and then segues into a gifted evening alone in a hotel room. In doing so, the film reveals the existential stagnation that extends from the disharmony between their ethical responsibilities and aesthetic desires. To depict this stagnancy and its relational implications, Before Midnight maintains the general aesthetic strategy of the trilogy. As with the prior two films, Link later utilises long dialogic shots to establish a sense of aesthetic immediacy. This is perceptible from the outset of the film. Just after dropping Henry, his son from his first marriage, off at the airport, Jesse rejoins Celine to drive back to the retreat where they are guests. The camera is mounted on the bonnet of their rental car, and through the windshield frames the couple sitting in the front and their young twin girls asleep in the back. This shot is held for almost 15 minutes as the couple discuss a range of topics, only once cutting away to a wide shot of some ancient ruins that they drive by. Significantly, this particular long shot does not grant the actors with the same degree of agency that it once did in the previous two films. There is a certain confinement that is imparted by the airtight enclosure of the car, the sight of its seatbelts strapping the couple in place, and the concentration it demands of Jesse in driving the vehicle. This view is corroborated when the couple, not wanting to wake their girls, decide to pass on the opportunity to stop at the ruins even though they promised that they would. Evidently, Jesse and Celine have traded the aesthetic possibilities offered by the Viennese tram and the Parisian riverboat for the aesthetic complacency of the 4x4. This extended shot effectively demonstrates how Jesse and Celine constantly negotiate their ethical responsibilities from within the ambiguous sphere of aesthetic irony that they collectively inhabit. As we shall see, however, this mode of existence is unsustainable. Jesse, now a successful novelist, comfortably remains in the immediate whimsy of aesthetic reflection. This is delineated through his extended monologues fantasizing on new book ideas and his sentimental impulse to uproot his entire life with Celine in Paris to return to Chicago to be near Henry, who lives under the custody of Jesse's alcoholic ex-wife. Celine, on the other hand, proves to be the more rational and responsible party of the couple, deeming the move illogical without at least securing joint custody. In these moments, she reveals her movement away from irony and towards a genuinely ethical self-choice, which is further corroborated through her ability to reliably care for her children and hold a steady job. She has made the crucial move to appropriating existentially the requirement of the ethical, to really take on board what this demand means for her when applied to her life. Yet there remains some hesitation to fully actualize her what climacus of concluding unscientific postscript terms, ethical passion. This is evident when Celine deliberates over a career opportunity with the French government. 
Whilst recognising it as a fantastic opportunity, she has resisted taking up the offer for over a year, primarily due to the increased workload. Notably, Jesse fuels his trepidation by expressing his disdain for her potential boss, which Celine quickly dismisses, citing his efficacy. This is only one of many examples that demonstrates Jesse's inability to sincerely perceive the requirements of the ethical, which then deters Celine's expression of such. How then are we to interpret Celine's existential constitution? The answer rests with Climacus, who accounts for this apparent confusion by pointing out that an ethicist may be using irony as their incognito because he grasps the contradiction between the manner in which he exists inwardly and the fact that he does not express it outwardly. Climacus relates this contradiction to the comic, writing that irony is one expression of such, and humour is another. John Lippitt considers this comic interpretation to be a vital theme in Kierkegaard's thought because the comic plays an integral role in communicating the ethical and religious and therefore reveals one's relation to the world. Observe Climacus. Quite generally, the comic is present everywhere, and every existence can be identified and assigned at once to its specific sphere by knowing how it relates to the comic. The more proficiently a person exists, the more he will discover the comic. What motivation would Celine have for this ironic charade? In Lippitt's view, there are two primary reasons. One, it protects her inner ethical integrity by placing the comic between herself and unethical individuals. And two, it provides a way to communicate the ethical indirectly, for the ethicist cannot communicate directly what it is to live ethically. In this sense, it is easy to see why Celine would adopt irony as her incognito. Her long-term partner and father to her children is a reflective aesthete, an individual who is unable to perceive the requirements of the ethical. Confronted with this dilemma, that is having to navigate ethical commitments with an unethical individual, there appears no other recourse but to use an ironic incognito to indirectly communicate the ethical requirements these shared commitments demand. Linklater's separation of the film into two distinct social spaces, the communal writer's retreat and the private hotel room, provides the opportunity to demonstrate the two dimensions of Celine's character, that is, her public ironic persona and her inner ethical passion. As the couple wine and dine at the retreat, reflecting on love and life as they do so, Celine entertains the companionship of her supposed friends, Stephanos and Ariadne. Apparently a good time is had by all. Yet Celine reveals her true opinion of their character later on in the hotel room gifted by these same friends. Expecting something quainter, she disdains their generous gesture and derides Stephanos' character. And, and I curse Ariadne and I curse Stephanos for doing this. Okay, a couple's massage? What the fuck is that? That sounds sleazy to me, right? You don't have to do it! Curiously, there is an undeniable degree of malice underscoring Celine's comments that calls into question a particularly controversial passage on irony wherein Climacus writes, In irony, there is no sympathy. It is self-assertion, and its sympathy is therefore sympathetic in an entirely indirect way, not with anyone in particular, but with the idea of self-assertion as every human being's possibility. Hence in women, one often finds humour but never irony. Any attempt at it is unseemingly, and a purely womanly nature will consider irony a kind of cruelty. In contrast to this statement, Linklater appears to go out of his way to demonstrate the capacity of ironic cruelty in women. Celine's ego-bruising insults targeted towards Jesse's sexual performance are far from sympathetic. Instead, they reveal her dissatisfaction with his predictability and indicate an ironic sexuality. We can also see a similarly ironic attitude towards religious and marital ceremony in the chapel scene, wherein she tartly dismisses the significance of the shrine to Saint Odilia found inside, and the aesthetic performance that weddings entail. Significantly, Jesse does not share her sentiment. His existential character, his proclivity for aesthetic reflection, remains consistent behind closed doors, for immediacy has the comic outside itself. Lacking the contradiction of ironic existence, Jesse's expressed affection for his friends and his appreciation of the chapel are genuine. Conversely, Celine's duplicitous behaviour effectively captures her ironic incognito through her external compliance with the expectations of society but internal repudiation of these objectives. What then distinguishes the irony of the ethicist incognito from that of an actual ironist? Sylvia Walsh observes that the latter upholds an ironic stance towards every finite reality, including his own existence. As we have seen Celine demonstrate in Before Sunset, 
this culminates in a persistent nihilistic detachment from life because an actual ironist has nothing positive to offer in place of the deficiencies of immediacy. Selene had not yet made the ethical self-choice. In contrast, the ethicist using irony as an incognito has emerged from this nihilistic detachment through continually appropriating the demands of the ethical and deliberately adopts irony to safeguard this process. This is the existential character that Selene exhibits in Before Midnight. Her ethical nature is revealed as the night unravels in the hotel room, and an argument erupts between the couple that uncovers the resentment of Selene, who carries most of the burden of familial life, and the unsatisfied egoism of Jesse, who constantly craves new aesthetic experiences. Selene's frustration stems from the sacrifices she has made in appropriating the requirements of the ethical, and Jesse's inability to sincerely perceive these requirements himself. As Selene's ironic incognito transmutes into the constant criticism of Jesse, who in turn tirelessly deflects genuine communication to seduction or reflective fantasy, their argument lays bare the existential stagnancy that has calcified in their union. This video series opened by claiming that the Before trilogy constantly resists the release from seduction. The analysis of all three films has revealed that this is partly achieved through the immediacy of the long take, which facilitates the restless existence of the aesthetic sphere insisted on by Jesse and entertained by Celine. Always receptive to aesthetic possibilities, the trilogy's form and content remain unsettled. This uncertain mode of relating to the world is also achieved through the open ends that conclude each film, and we can see this tradition continue in Before Midnight. With their relationship on the verge of breakdown, Jesse's peace treaty comes in the form of a fabricated letter, apparently written by Celine's future self, as a seductive appeal to her inner aesthete. In the end, the letter appears to charm Celine for the moment, but the fate of their relationship is ultimately left ambiguous. Certainly, openness characterises the Before trilogy, and this epitomises the ascetic mode of relating to the world in its renunciation of finality. In other words, the Before trilogy recruits the long take to establish an immediate relation to the world, and then extends this mode of relation indefinitely through its open ends. Consequently, each film effectively exists as an open frame, which renders the trilogy permeable despite Linklater grounding the three films firmly in the present moment. Altogether, this aesthetic strategy parallels a lack of ethical commitment that characterises the lives of Jessie and despite her eventual efforts, Celine. In so doing, this same strategy keeps the possibility of erotic romantic love alive, albeit void of duty. In Kierkegaard's view, continuing along this existential path will almost surely end in the realisation of their underlying despair, if they have not already realised it. In Works of Love, he identifies the issue in exalting erotic or spontaneous love, as opposed to agape love, writing, the despair is due to relating oneself with infinite passion to a particular something, for one can relate oneself with infinite passion, unless one is in despair, only to the eternal. Spontaneous love is in despair in this way, but when it becomes happy, as it is called, its being in despair is hidden from it. When it becomes unhappy, it becomes manifest that it was in despair. This brings us to the overarching question the trilogy appears to pose. Can our ethical responsibilities and aesthetic desires be reconciled? As George Patterson and C.S. Evans Ava, Kierkegaard seems confident that they can. The ethical does not exclude the aesthetic. Yet caught between the idealism of Jesse and the cynicism of Celine, Linklater provides no definitive answer. He lets the viewer decide with whom to sympathise, just as Kierkegaard achieves through his pseudonymity. Will their relationship survive the demands of familial life? The enduring couple's eventual ceasefire contains a glimmer of hope that this prospect may one day arrive. In the interim, however, Jesse and Celine leave us wondering whether Johannes was right in saying every relationship is over as soon as one has tasted the final enjoyment. <laughs>